Hello and welcome to the USDCA headquarters in West Bend, Wisconsin. My name is Tim Schmidt. I'm the president and founder of the United States Concealed Carry Association. Now we're getting ready to kick off tonight's live training broadcast. The topic for the training is how knowing your surroundings could save your life. Believe me, we've got some great training lined up for later tonight. In fact, I'm about to head over to the studio to get ready right now. But first, I want to show you the true events that inspired tonight's topic. You see, it all started with the video you can see on the screen right now. Now, this is real security camera footage of an attack. Later tonight, we're going to put some of our trainees through a scenario very similar to the one that you're about to watch. But I do want to remind everyone, this is a video of a violent attack. We've tried to keep it as appropriate as possible, but just be aware of that. Now, it might be hard, but I want you to imagine yourself in this checkout line when an emotionally disturbed person does something like this. We have an update on the breaking news story we told you about at the beginning of this newscast. There's an incident at the Target in East Liberty on Penn Avenue. Several people inside the store apparently have been stabbed. David Highfield is live now at the scene with the latest on just what happened. David, what can you tell us? Well, Stacy, very active scene here. We are hearing that five people were injured, at least four of them stabbed. They were taken to Presby, Shadyside, and Children's Hospital. I'm told the most serious was actually taken to Children's Hospital, although we are hearing right now none of the injuries appear to be life-threatening. Now, I'm joined now by three people were, who were inside the store when this happened. And, Dominique, I want to start with you. What did you see inside there? Um, well, by the time I got in there, I was right in front of him, maybe like about five steps in front of him. This was a man with a knife. Yeah, everybody was screaming. He grabbed, he seen every, all the men coming after him. He grabbed him a hostage. I heard she was 16 years old. She got stabbed twice. They attacked the guy after that, started beating him up. Um, he, he, got, he had a knife in his hand about this big, about this wide. He ran into one of the guys, sliced him in his face. He sliced one guy's uh, finger halfway off. Um, by the time the cops came, they tased him. He was down on the ground. I mean, he was still responsive, so he was still screaming. They tried to rob me. They had my wallet. It was a little was off, like you know. Off, yeah. yeah, because nobody was trying to rob him. I was already in the store when this happened, and I hear a lady screaming because I'm in the back of the store. And a lady screaming or whatever, like someone's up there trying to stab people. So I just led the people from the back of the store out to the emergency exit because I worked there. So I just knew where to go. So I just left out of there quick because that's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, tell me, this actually started, your understanding is it actually started outside the store here along Penn Avenue, right? Yeah, down on Howland Avenue. Avenue that okay. We were standing outside the store and my friend over there, he came out running around the corner like, oh, some guy just tried to stab me. And there was a few other people down there. And when they came out, they all ran up the street. The guy, he runs in the Target in here. And when he got upstairs, I heard he was swinging around the knife. He was stabbing at people. Like I guess he tried to cut my friend. And people had chased him up with a bat, and he was a little off. Uh, they tried to take my wallet and all kinds of stuff. It was crazy. It was, it was and, at one, and at one point, he actually took a hostage. Yes. He took this, yeah, what appears to be a teenage girl. Yeah, he took a white woman. I come to find out she was 16, so she was a teenager. But she was stabbed twice. Yeah. I was hurt. I didn't. I didn't see exactly where she got stabbed at. But when she was on her way out, it was said that she got stabbed in her chest, in her chest twice. All right. Well, thank you for the information. We're we're glad that you're okay. Again, police tell me that this actor is in custody right now. This man with the knife. It, it started outside here on Penn Avenue and then went into the store. Again, five people injured, at least four of them stabbed. It appears as though none of those injuries are life threatening. We will stay here, and as soon as we get any new information for you, we will let you know. For now, reporting live in East Liberty, David Highfield, KDKA TV News. All right, now I know that's hard to watch, but what's really important here is what I said just before we started the video. I said, imagine yourself in that situation. And that is the key because your body can't go where your mind has never been. That's why we do this training. So we'll be digging into this scenario much deeper during the live training event tonight. So make sure that you stick with us. We've got a lot more to cover and our live panel of experts are getting set up right now. In fact, I'm gonna go head over and join them. I'll see you in a bit.
All right, welcome to the USDCA studio for tonight's live event. I gotta tell you, the first thing that comes into my mind uh, for tonight is that I'm very grateful that you're here. If you're here right now, there's one of two things. Number one, um, you, you wanna learn more. And, and number two, you're, you're willing to, to be your family's first line of defense. Um, and if that's the case for you, that, that makes me proud and excited to be able to, to help you out. Um, as you can imagine, there's a ton of USCCA employees here. I believe we have over 100 of our 264 employees that are working tonight to make this production work. We've got all the folks down in the call center. We've got the folks that I can see right now here in the studio. We've got the folks to my left and to my right. Um, and it's all about us giving and helping you, helping you become that, that better responsibly armed citizen. So let's get this started. I want to introduce my guest tonight. Um, to my far right, of course, we have Kevin Michalowski. Kevin is the executive editor of Concealed Carry Magazine. Kevin, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Tim. Appreciate it. Um, next over here, we have uh, Spencer Jacobson. Spencer was one of the many um, trainees that we had. Spencer, I really enjoyed watching your video. Good job tonight. Thank you. I can't wait to, uh, to, to hear more of your feedback and, and for you to share some of the stuff that you learned. That's going to be cool. Absolutely. Um, to my left here, of course, we have attorney Tom Grieve. Tom Grieve is one of the top criminal defense attorneys in the state of Wisconsin. And um, as for those of you who have seen this before, you also know that, that uh, he's kind of my color commentator. He's, <laughs> he's the one that tells jokes that are funnier than mine, which uh, kind of makes me wonder why he's still on this show. I just have, I just have better writers <laughs> is just what it is. So. Uh, Tom, as usual, I'm really glad you're here. Appreciate it. Thanks. And last but not least, we have Beth Alcazar. She is an associate editor and one of our top trainers for USCCA. Beth, thanks for being here. Thanks, Tim. All right, team, let's get this thing rolling. So you should see somewhere on your screen right now, we've got some, some great tonight only bonuses for those of you who are members or for those of you who for some reason haven't joined the USCCA yet. Um, so be sure you take advantage of that. But honestly, I think it's time to dive into the meat and potatoes. So as for those of you that have already seen all of the pre-videos, which I hope most of you already did that because it's really important to, to kind of get that backstory before we dive into tonight. Um, for those of you that, uh, that have seen those, you know, we put three different people through, I'm sorry, four different people through uh, almost the exact same scenario. And from my perspective, it was fascinating to watch how each different um, trainee uh, reacted and what they learned and what they did do and what they didn't do. Um, so as you can imagine, we're going to be dealing with uh, uh, Spencer here first. So Spencer, let's, uh, let's queue up that, that, that uh, review video and, and let's get this thing rolling. Unfortunately, I'm no good. Not a whole lot. It's okay, guys. Because I really can't do anything without it. Like, I really have to have it. Okay, Max, thank you for that recap video. I think that helped all of us kind of get back into the mode of, of remembering exactly what happened. Um, you know, Spencer, one of the coolest things about these live training broadcasts is that we get all sorts of questions that our viewers uh, will send in, you know, wondering about what it was like to be in that scenario. 
Um, so I think it's time to go through the questions. And so the first question is, so, so Spencer, you, you had no idea what was going to happen to you. So, I mean, what was actually going through your mind when, right when Kevin showed up? Uh, when Kevin walked in the room, first thought was, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you're welcome. I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it meant a proving ground, which I was excited for, but definitely wasn't ready for. <laughs> I think you did pretty well, I mean, for not being ready, but that's the whole point of this thing is that, you know, no one ever knows when this is going to happen, and that's what we try to stress to people all the time, and we took this video right from the news. This is something right. that actually happened. A, a guy walked into a department store with a knife, he'd already stabbed someone outside, and he started stabbing a young girl inside, and, and you could see on the video nobody knew what they were going to do. It was, it was just pandemonium. Cool. So let's do, let's do another question. So this question comes from a, uh, a, a viewer named Chuck and a, and a bunch of others as well. So if there's a threat and you're about to engage that target, should you close the distance to make it easier to, to, to hit the target? What, what I makes think the if you can do there? so safely, absolutely. I mean, uh, the goal of shooting is hitting, and you're responsible for every one of your shots. Uh, if you have the opportunity to close that distance and get closer to the target and put more rounds on target to stop the threat faster, Absolutely. But remember, this is counterintuitive. There's a guy over there, in this case, swinging a knife, and you don't want to be closer to that person. You typically want to be farther away. Yeah. But if you've committed to the action to try and stop this guy, why not do it as best you can, get as close as you can, and put as many shots as quickly on target as you can. Spencer, have you, did you have a chance to really watch this video and like do a deep dive in it, or did you just kind of live it and you haven't gone back to rewatch <laughs> it? I, I've seen the video. I haven't done an extreme deep dive, deep dive of it. How many seconds do you think it took you from the moment that the, that the knife came out against the victim for you to draw your firearm? Do, do you have an impression? To draw the firearm? To I actually draw the firearm. I believe three or four seconds. I had you at six seconds, which really, which really says something. So, you know, when I look at stuff as an attorney, um, and Beth was laughing at me ahead of time because she saw some of my notes, <laughs> and I had everything charted out down to the second. At this particular second, he did this. At this particular second, he did that, and so forth. So I thought that was really interesting to see how different people responded when they were faced with this. Is how long did it take them to, if they, well, they all put their, their hand towards their firearm uh, yeah. at some point or another, but obviously only a, not everybody drew their firearm, but it's really interesting to see that uh, and then to see are you retreating backwards, are you going forwards, and you, you did a little bit of both to, mm -hmm. to what Kevin was saying. And, and you know, typically uh, we tell people all the time that, that unless you're prepared, unless you know what you want to do, you're looking at the situation and you go through this decision-making process of what's happening, oh, is this happening, oh, it's not happening, oh, I guess it's happening, I better do something <clears throat> about that. <laughs> and yeah, six seconds later you decided, okay, I'm taking out my gun. And when you decided to draw your gun, were you fully committed to what you were doing or were you still thinking there might be some other actions? Once I drew the firearm, I knew what I would be doing mm -hmm. and I was committed to that action. Okay, yeah. And, and when you started shooting, you, you continued firing until we called end scenario, until you know, the, we, we need to shoot until the threat stops. Beth, did you see anything that well, you noticed? I hate to back it up even before <laughs> the uh, attack happened, but some interesting things do happen as you're walking into this, this layout. I think maybe you were hyper aware, you knew it was uh, some kind of scenario that would involve action. So his reaction to the guy just saying, hey man, which game, was very intriguing because he kind of pushes him away mm -hmm. and there's almost like a dude, <coughs> personal space, you know? Yeah. It's good to have <laughs> personal space in a personal bubble for sure. But I think what we see here is that there is definitely opportunity and importance for us to look at body language and posturing when it comes to someone who is about to attack. So I would highly encourage people to kind of go and research those things, mm -hmm. what to look for when someone is up to no good, because you'll see yeah. certain mm -hmm. cues, <laughs> characteristics, yeah. and this guy didn't have any of those, but Spencer was aware, he was ready. <laughs> yeah, we, we published the book, The Crucial Advantage, which talks about pre-threat indicators and what you're seeing when, when there's a threat to be made. And I noticed you really focused on the guy at the counter yeah. who had a gun in his back pocket, we sort of threw you that bone to try to throw you off the scent a little bit. And, and once you saw that gun, I, I don't think you looked anywhere else for a mm -hmm. while. Did you see the guy with the knife come in? I didn't even see him come in. I, <laughs> I was staring at that gun in that back pocket. And he was specifically carrying his knife in his right hand just for everybody to see, just walking through the crowd. 
you know, and it, it never even registered. He made it all the way from where you came in, all the way to the back side of the store, and picked out his target. So, so I want to just bring something up here quick. I, I think that Beth brought up a really good point about how Spencer obviously was in a very heightened state of awareness. You'd almost mm -hmm. call it almost co code orangish, right? I mean, yeah, he, he was yeah. looking for something, <laughs> um, which was indicated by the way he, he, and he, and he mm -hmm. immediately responded to the guy who was asking about the two games. Um, and actually, that brings up the next question, which the per, the, this person asks, I know Spencer tried to keep his distance from strangers, even those who had questions. How do you do that without escalating something, especially if you're in a crowded place? And, and so I, I want to talk a little bit about that, because I think it makes sense if, if you think through how, how you would talk to a person, let's say, that was approaching you at a gas station. Mm -hmm. right? They're walking towards you, asking a question. You, know, you need to have some words in your vocabulary or some gestures to be like, Hey, I'd love to help you. Just stay right there. Yeah. You know, and or or just kind of like a nice step back. Hey, you know, what what can I do for you? Um, and if you don't pre-rehearse those things, if you don't think through, you're not. You probably will freeze and you won't do anything. And and you have to understand too the context of where you are. You know, three in the morning, you have to stop for gas. Typical person is not coming up to talk to you at a gas station just because they want to be your buddy. That's a great point. You know? yeah. and, but when you're in, a, in a, a toy store like this and somebody reaches out and says, I'm looking for a toy for my kid, <laughs> that might not be a pre-threat indicator right there. You know, but, but again, I tried to tell Spencer as we drove, Spencer, this is deadly force decision making. This is not a fight. He wasn't buying it. He knew he was getting in a fight. Um, so it, that's why we throw in the extra diversionary tactics. The other guy with the gun, the people arguing back and forth. And during that scenario, did you hear anybody yelling at you? Oh, yes, the mm. cowboy. Yeah, absolutely. We, we mm. had people in, the role players were specifically designed to do specific things. One person was telling you to shoot the guy. One person was telling yep. you to run away. One person was hollering for you to help. So um, we wanted to see what you were listening for and what was going on around you in there. And it gets to be kind of a mess, doesn't it? It was, it was certainly <laughs> hectic. Did you <laughs> hear anyone else, or did you just hear the cowboy? Uh, I heard the guy yelling at the girl, saying that he's going to kill her, um, and then the cowboy was in my ear screaming, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him. Yeah. So that it got, it was hard to ignore that. So every That's time cool. he yelled, you fired another shot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe two for yeah. one. But. <laughs> so, so guys, let's go to the next question. I just, just popped up here on my screen. If there are multiple shots with only a few hits, what are the ramifications for the shots that miss? <laughs> Tom? It depends where they go. I mean, at the end of the day, and, and, and second thing, it really depends upon the laws of your state. So without spending too much time on it, we have such things as what's called transferred intent. So we also have such things in some states as felony murder. So as an example, let's say, and again, check your local listings, uscca.com slash laws with an S at the end to learn more and get a crash course on how the gun laws work in your state. But as an example, if Spencer was shooting at the bad guy and missed and hit that poor woman who is the victim. It could be that, you know what, if everybody agrees that Spencer was acting in self-defense, that if that woman was injured or even fatally wounded, that the actual charges uh, for that homicide could be assessed against the bad guy, against the attacker. Uh, it could be that he could be exonerated off the fact of, look, he was acting in lawful self-defense or defense of another, in this case, uh, and you know what, as a result, it, it unfortunately is what it is to a degree. But I say to a degree because there's two different battles we have to worry about after the smoke settles. Number one, we've got the criminal ramifications of being, in essence, sued by the government. You're facing jail time, prison time, massive fines, you name it. But secondly, civil lawsuits as well. So just because the state prosecutor's office says, you know what, we think you acted okay, don't think for a second necessarily that that person's own plaintiff attorney is going to agree with them. Yeah, and absolutely. Good, good you, feedback. Yeah, you're responsible for those <laughs> rounds going out there. And, and honestly, there's going to be a serious investigation. You know, if there's a shootout in a store and 10 rounds are flying around, um, you know, you're going to have investigators from the, the state crime lab and everybody in there trying to figure out just exactly what happened. And, and the honest truth is that we're the good guys. We're going to wait around and see what the course of that investigation happens. So we're going to need some help. And just to kind of that point as well, you know, look, I understand, we all understand up here that ammunition isn't getting cheaper, all right? And particularly nice self-defense ammunition is not getting cheaper. But it's a hell of a lot cheaper when you compare that to the ramifications of lawsuits, jail times, everything else. So taking that extra time to train, to use your sights, 
Um, Spencer, I think, found them afterwards. So, you know, there's, there's that. <laughs> yeah. uh, he did a great job, though. He, he really did. Um, but uh, all the training up front, I mean, you want to talk about spending <coughs> pennies to save dollars. This is that training, 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 training. Yeah, good, good point, Tom. All right, I think we got time for one more question for Spencer, and this one actually is directed right at Spencer. So, Spencer, uh, I'll read it from the screen here. So, why didn't Spencer just choose to leave? Uh, well, that's, uh, I guess, a personal decision that I value the life of people around me, and when I saw a woman who was an innocent person being attacked and her life being very much threatened, it was a quick choice for me to want to help versus wanting to flee, especially that he had a knife and not a gun. Yeah. I don't know what the situation would have done for myself if it had been a firearm, but uh, with him only having a knife, at least as far as I knew, I knew that I certainly had the upper hand, especially from my standpoint. Hmm. Good for you, man. All right, well, thanks again for, uh, for doing that scenario. Really appreciate you being on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, I think it's time to see what our next trainee did. Her name was MJ. Max, let's roll that tape. What's up, What's up guys? Hey. How are you doing today? I got this book okay. uh, for my nephew, but it turns out he's already got it. So oh, okay, no problem. I don't need it. Definitely I'm understand sure it's really that. Awesome, but, yeah, so you just want to return it? Yeah, I just want to return it. Can. Okay, sure thing. Um, I just need the receipt and then I can get you a full oh, refund, which is obvious. Yeah, 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 sure, no problem. Yeah. I, uh, I actually don't have the receipt. Oh, excuse me for a second. Uh, I got a birthday party for my nephew and I have no idea what kind of game I should get him. How old is he? Six. He's six? Yeah. I mean, I don't got a long time here, so like, what do you, I mean, is that too old? You know, that I think old? that you should probably ask one of the store people because I've never played video games. All right, well, yeah. I've never been here before. But yeah. Right, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the store credit really doesn't. Well, do you think that maybe like you left it at home? Like we're open until nine well, today, so. Okay. Well, um, my manager won't be in until twelve, but you can definitely come back then and you can talk to him. I got, I got work in like forty-five minutes. I, I hear you. I mean, you could come back. I mean, we really, I really have to have the receipt in order to do the exchange. Like, the are you in line? No, you're okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'll just. I'm oh just no, honey, you're fine. Yeah. yeah. What you do, what you gotta do. Um, so you're telling me that if I don't have the receipt, yeah, I can't do anything. That's correct. I can only do store credit. So like, okay. You have. Like, what, what kind of? Shit is this? Um, hey, calm down, man. It's just a game. Wait, like, dude, I'm out fifty bucks here. You want to buy the book? Hey, sorry, huh? I'm just here for this, right? Sir. Take this with you. See if you have the receipt at home. If you bring the book back I'll with the receipt, okay. we can it's do the return. It's 2019, right? It's 2019. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, here, I'll tell you what. Oh, oh, my, oh my God! Oh my God! Hey! Get down! Shoot him! Shoot him! Shoot him. Oh my God! He's gonna kill. Oh, oh. MJ, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you. I can certainly understand that, that going through these scenarios is challenging, um, stressful, so, so thanks for doing it. Are you ready for some questions? Sure. So the first question that was um, sent in from, from one of our viewers was, they noticed that, um, that you could have run away, but, but you didn't. So what was going through your head? Yeah, um, you know, the first thing I noticed was the disparity of force. She was probably like a third of his size. Mm -hmm. um, and I just felt really protective immediately. I mean, she, she looked terrified. The knife was up near her neck. I mean, there, she was seconds away from, from potentially dying, and he looked like he had that intent. So um, it was an automatic thing to just move towards her to try to help. Mm. So from your perspective, you didn't even really go through a thought process. It was just like, boom, you're, yeah, you're on this. Absolutely. Wow, yeah. cool, interesting. Um, all right, next question. So how do you know when to stop shooting if you've already shot the attacker multiple times? Is that still legal to keep shooting? Well, a lot of what we get, um, you know, through the police academy and stuff like that is shoot until the threat stops, you know. And, uh, and then uh, there are instructors at the academy who told us shoot until the person falls away from your front sight. Keep shooting that person. You don't, you're not often going to see what the hits, you know, it's not like squib loads in the <coughs> movies where blood's flying out and stuff like that. You don't know what's going on until the violent assault of behavior stops or begins to subside. Mm 
mm -hmm. and, until you get some sort of reaction like that. Um, on, in the video, you know, in the scenario, MJ shot this nice man two times and then went, <laughs> okay, I guess we're done now. And, and, you know, he was still a viable threat. And um, we, Beth and I in the back, had nothing else to do. It was like, okay, she's done. This is over. We need to stop the scenario. Um, but it gave us a good place to talk about this sort of thing, um, about continuing your action until his actions stop for certain. It's interesting yeah. you say that because I've, I've been uh, to the range my entire life. And, you know, you, like, you fire and then you're like, okay, and then you fire and, you know. And even after this scenario where like, you can't do that, you will die. <laughs> yeah. um, I went yeah. and I tried to practice on, on metal targets and I, it was so hard to, you know, I'd hear the ping and then be like, stop stopping. You know, like it, it's still so hard to, to continue that process. So this really opened my eyes personally as, as an armed American to train better for these scenarios. Maybe you could shoot with Spencer a little bit. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you guys yeah, could help see, us. See how, see how Gotta be goes. a balance yeah. there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What, what did you see as, as this all unfolded around you? I know we gave you very specific instructions as you walked into the store. What did, what did you see? What did you notice? Um, first, the guy that was a little bit angry about games. Um, and as, as a woman, you know, he was bigger than me. And, and when he started to get heated, I really wanted to direct that energy to someone else. And um, fortunately, I was able to do that. Um, but I didn't really have a plan for that. You know, like you were talking about before, like, you know, what, what's your plan? And I was thinking, I don't, I don't have one. Mm. So that was really interesting because if he had been the attacker, I would have been screwed because he was already here. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. um, I had already let him in that space. Mm -hmm. So he was a little spooky. Um, and then I saw popcorn. And that's great because I love popcorn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what we wanted you to buy. Oh, man. <laughs> it's all about that. Yeah. Um, and then the, the guy in front of me, you know, I could see kind of something behind him and, and he reached, but it ended up being his phone. So then I was really confused. Mm. Um, and I actually didn't see the gigantic dude with the bloody knife walking through the store at <laughs> no. all. Not at yeah. all. <laughs> it's amazing. We take a guy who's 6'5 and we walk him right through the crowd. Yeah. And no, he disappears. Nobody, yep, no, he yeah. disappears. Gorilla nobody, of a dude. Nobody, yep, nobody pays attention to him. Well, and just touching on that, that whole idea of being very situationally aware, you touch on the fact that you knew that the guy was having kind of a not comfortable conversation about the game or the book or whatever he was exchanging. It was yeah. a book, but mm -hmm. I noticed in the video though, your back is to them and you're just, you know, casually looking at magazines and I'm thinking to myself, move around the table, turn around, look, put some For distance. Sure. I mean, in my yeah. head, the alarm systems were going off and I was mm -hmm. just thinking, oh no, she could be in so Stop much trouble if she mind. doesn't turn around and look at this argument or, you know, at least from, your peripheral vision, see what's happening there. So that was intriguing to me because it probably happened so quickly and so naturally. You're just, you know, I'm looking at magazines. You said later on, I was trying to find one I liked. Yeah, yeah they so were pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just another guy arguing in a game store. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Second guy, yeah. yeah. I mean, he was kind of so. disgruntled. I would have probably, you know, maybe angled my body just slightly different, but mm -hmm. you were just yeah. comfortably looking at, looking at the popcorn. Mm -hmm. So, so one question that came up, um, I believe it was asked, um, or it was discussed with Spencer and with you, MJ, what, what was the whole concept? I think Kevin was like, did you see your front sight? Mm -hmm. And so this next question says, why don't people see their front sights in a situation like this? It, it, let's let Beth go with this oh, one. Oh gosh, because, tunnel vision yeah. is the thing that automatically comes to mind for me. I've suffered from it since I was a kid, playing you know concert piano kinds of things. My parents, when I was a five-year-old, you know, you did great. And I said, well, I can't see the keys. So I would basically play blind because I had such bad tunnel vision. So when it comes to high stress anxiety, now that wasn't even high stress anxiety. So imagine life or death, mm -hmm. that tunnel vision can just be exacerbated. It can just go tenfold what, what would normally happen. And so all that disappears and all you see is bad guy with knife or bad guy with gun. Mm -hmm. And that's why we get a lot of people when they shoot defensively, they shoot hands because they see a knife or they see a gun and that's where their vision is drawn automatically and everything else is like it's not even there. Yeah, you have, disappears. You get that target fixation on what is the threat and you're, you're pushing your gun forward at the threat. Um, I have to, when I try to shoot fast, when I, when I shoot quickly like when we were out at gun sight, I have to say to myself in my head, find your front sight, find your front sight, find your front sight, put that on the target. Um, you know, if if it came down to it, and and uh, the one time that I had to pull my gun when I was on duty, I didn't have to fire it. 
that's what I was saying to myself was, okay, where's my front sight? Because, you know, he's getting really too close now. And, and those sorts of things don't happen without practice. If you're not walking around, you know, <clears throat> being, being that prepared that when I pull my gun, I'm going to look for my front sight, you're not going to see it. You're going to go with the flash sight picture with what's up in front of you. Like, my gun is kind of out there, and I'm, uh, you know, that's why we, we talk about, you know, focusing on some marksmanship skills, but understanding you're shooting very quickly from a very close range. Mm -hmm. And all this is absolutely true. You know, I've, I've worked with people who have had to use and fire their firearms in self-defense, and I always go through this, and it's very nearly the same story in repeat over and over and over again, exactly what Beth, exactly what Kevin, exactly what I was talking about, where you are just focusing on the weapon, you're focusing on the hand that's in the air. Um, you can't describe the face, but you can describe what position their hand was in and stuff mm. like that. Um, this, this is very real, and if you think it's not going to happen to you, think again. And that's where all these training techniques and preparing yourself for maybe what you don't want to have happen, but what we can realistically forecast can happen, can make all the difference again. Good, good points. So MJ, I have a question for you. So I, I know that it, you were kind of quasi-surprised in terms of like you were kind of getting fake interviewed and then all of a sudden, holy cow, it's happening right now. So I know that was a surprise, but once, once you, you know, got, you came to the, the fake store and the experience began, what was the thing, that, the one thing that surprised you the most about all of it? Kind of putting you on the spot here, but this, this will be good. <laughs> Appreciate the it's confidence. It's gonna be amazing, it's gonna be amazing. Um, you know, I think the thing that, that truly caught me off guard the most, and I said the same thing to my family, is, I, you know, I knew this scenario was happening, but there were, there were so many people moving around mm. to keep track of and, and, and so much to try to be aware of and so much to try to make a plan for in that moment that it was just completely overwhelming. Wow. And I think, again, you know, I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but that scenario-based training is just so crucial because it's too much to process just mm -hmm. in the moment okay there's six seven eight people here maybe more maybe you're in a crowd like what trying to figure out a plan for all of them and what all of them could potentially do is just mm -hmm. you know i i froze like that's and it opened my eyes like <laughs> scenario yeah. based training wow. is just crucial mm -hmm. wow awesome awesome answer i knew it would be good <laughs> um, well i think we got time for one last question and this question is from skip he says how close does a knife attacker I'm sorry, how close does a knife attacker need to be before they are considered a threat? Uh, yeah, I don't care. You know, I'm more scared of a knife than I am of a gun. Mm. Um, knife, you know, it's very hard to get a knife out of someone's hand because, you know, the business end is coming at you. Um, you know, typically we talk about the, the Tuller drill being this, this 21 foot. Some people say rule or not. Um, some people have stretched it out to 28 feet. Um, people can cross distance very quickly, um, at least 21 feet, before you can draw your gun and put two accurate rounds on that target. And so inside of 21 feet, someone with a knife is, is a deadly threat, especially if they don't have to go through or around anything to get to you. Um, and at that point, if somebody starts slashing you, um, you know, consider what a bullet wound is. You know, it, it is a, a half inch channel that's probably making a hole and, and there's some other problems inside you. But somebody starts cutting you with a knife, you're talking about huge gaping wounds to large muscle groups, and, and it's real trouble. And to reiterate what MJ said, what about disparity of force? Mm -hmm. You know, in this scenario, we've got a very petite woman with a huge man with a knife. So if he were up against someone that was more his size and strength and ability, there might have been a better chance, but that would also certainly come into play. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in agreement. I don't like pokey sticks. They're yeah, sharp and I, deadly. Yeah. I, I hate it when people say he only had a knife. You know, only? No, oh. no, no, I'm sorry. He had a knife. That's that's, that's enough. And actually, MJ, I think you were the fastest person on drawing the firearm. Oh, when really? Was, when I was breaking everything down, yeah, I think mm. I think you were the absolute fastest. You had your firearm out, Good job. rounds on target, well, ish, uh, <laughs> four seconds in, and oh, wow. that you were, you were putting rounds on target before other people drew their firearm. So. I distinctly remember dropping the popcorn. That was like my <laughs> first heartbreak. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank gotta, you. I gotta get rid of the popcorn and now get well, the business. Good that you did. A lot of people don't yep. drop what's in their hands. Yeah, so we've that's had, that's really. a plus. We've had that. Yeah, we've seen that in our scenarios where people just say, I'm hanging on to this gift for my yeah. wife. It's a no reaction, what. right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like yeah. Phil. Yeah. Phil yeah. actually. Phil, Phil would, would not let go of that bag. Yeah. Yeah. Still there. So, yeah. Awesome. 
Uh, MJ, great job. Thank you so much for Thank being a part guys. of this. You did Definitely. an excellent job in the interview. And I think it's time to watch the video from our next um, attendee, or not attendee, but trainee. His name is Jared. So Max, let's roll that video right now. I'll tell you honestly, I've never seen anything like that. Star Wars, you can't lose any, any anywhere. Hey, no problem. Have a good one. You can talk to him, but he can, he'll tell you exactly the same thing. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Let's go. I can't find the receipt. Okay, well, I do have to have the receipt in order to do the return. So if you want to. Sure, man. Just a Hey, listen, dude. I'm just trying to do this. Let's over here. Come on. Just chill out. Chill out. I can't I know anything about this computer. Mind. You really have to have that. If you want a return of all of your money, I have to have the yeah. receipt. Well, the, oh, so now I'm out 50 bucks, and I can't do a damn thing with this book. <laughs> Sir, no. I can't do anything for you. You want to buy it? What is it? I can't return this book here without the receipt. Well, typically happens. Hey, that's something you know my kid might be into. Buy it off you. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. All right. Hey, let's get this done then. Cool. Hey, I'll do that. Huh? Hey! Hey! Oh, yeah, we need a phone! Shut up! Oh, everybody, get your f***ing phone! Put your f***ing phone down! You're so special, huh? Where do you think you're going, big boy? I'm gonna f***ing cut her head off! Where do you think you're going, huh? Hey, get over here, phone boy! You wanna record this? I'll record this! Oh, f***ing man! Mr. Killer! Cut your f***ing head off! Yeah, I'm so Huh? Oh, my God! We're going up! Leave him! Well, I'm sitting here with Jared, our third trainee for this live training broadcast, Proving Ground. Jared, thanks for being here. Tim, thanks for having me. Glad to see everyone again. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing real good. How about uh, everyone else? I've been kind of watching, see everyone's doing good, so I'm glad to see that. Awesome. Well, I, I would like to start things out with the questions, and my first question is, is you know, during your scenario, you decided to escape. Mm -hmm. Tell me about what went through your head. Tell me about the thought process. I mean, anything you could share, I'd love to hear that. So the thought process behind it is when I was up at the counter and I saw the struggle happening, um, there was a hesitation. I wanted to draw. I wanted to try and save this woman. But the way that they were going back and forth, there was no way that I could actually get on target and make good hits without possibly hurting somebody else. And everything behind them, I mean, their storeroom, we don't know if there was other employees back there. And we own every bullet that comes out of our gun. So mm. if I would have hit an innocent because I didn't know what was beyond my target, it, it was just, it, it wasn't a good scenario where I could make a clean shot and stop the threat without possibly doing more damage. Mm. And as it turns out, you had a clear exit and, and you took that exit. I did. Yeah, we, we always ask people, you know, what are you willing to jump in that shark tank for? And, you know, these, um, this person was a total stranger. You know, would this scenario have played out differently if we'd have sent you in there with someone who was your wife or your sister or someone like that? And, and that suddenly becomes the, uh, the victim. Without a doubt, it would have completely played out different. And, like, the first thought <laughs> in my mind when I was going through this scenario is I am alone. I'm in this store alone. There's nobody in here that I know. But if I were with my kids, if I was with my wife, would I have reacted different? And I'm, I watched the scenario over and over in my head, and obviously as it's playing, and absolutely, there would be a completely different um, reaction had it been my wife or my kids or someone trying to attack someone that's close to my heart. Yeah, and Jared, I, I totally understand that. That makes sense to me. So let me ask you this though, what would happen if you were in that same situation with all strangers, but now you're, you're pinned down and there's no way to escape? How, how would you have reacted differently, do you think? At, at that point, I probably would have moved myself into a position where I could um, take more of a clear shot and be able to um, stop the threat without hopefully hurting anyone else. But 
if I was at a point where I couldn't get out, then if I had to take a deadly force action, absolutely. Okay. I really love that answer. Um, you said move to a position where you could get a clear shot. When we're talking about target isolation, target isolation is not something that happens in a vacuum. It's something that we can have a little bit of control over. Mm -hmm. We can change our angle. We can change our elevation. You know, um, if, if there's a crowd and you need to bend down and shoot upwards, so you're shooting up away from the crowd, you can use that, and that works as target isolation if you're in a position where you where you can't get away. Um, and, and this comes back to preclusion, too. It's, you know, deadly force is the last thing you want to do. Oh, absolutely. So, um, I don't even remember if you drew your gun. I know I, you were I reaching for it. Um, and, and then you looked at the exit and then thought, nope, I ain't no part of this. Uh, I've got stuff I need to do somewhere else. I had, uh, <laughs> I had clear egress, and absolutely. I mean, one of the biggest things, especially learning from the training here at the USCCA with the defensive shooting fundamentals, is get off the X. Mm -hmm. So had it been a different situation where I couldn't get out, I'm getting off that X, and I need to get myself into a position where I can, I can safely eliminate the threat. Yeah, you were moving pretty much the whole time, and yeah. that's one of the things that yeah. I noticed. Well, I have that's to be it. honest. When I was watching this take place, I was actually, when it was over, I'm like cheering in the back, like, yes, this is awesome. <laughs> I was excited on, I guess, for numerous reasons. Number one, isn't this the core of really what we're teaching in our classes, the avoid, escape, defend in that order mm -hmm. every time, if possible. And um, you said to me, when we are just kind of talking one-on-one, -on -one, that, you know, I'm really sad for her or for anybody else. No doubt that is a terrible thing. But you said, I need to be home for my wife and my kids. And that is what rang true for me because we have to make that decision as responsibly armed Americans now, right now before any of this would ever play out and see what are you willing to do or not do mm -hmm. in those cases. Because Jared, I'm with you. I would have done, even with the training I have under the circumstances, that is still my responsibility to my family, first and foremost. They need me home. Absolutely. Wow. And I think one of the most important words in any self-defense situation is aftermath. What is going to happen after this is all over? This scenario lasted 30 seconds, maybe, for everybody who went through it. Yeah. After that 30 seconds, Tom, how long does it take to go through the trial process? Years. <laughs> and possibly hundreds of thousands of dollars. Countless nights of lost sleep. Mm -hmm. a job, a career, maybe lose a mortgage or two. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty ugly. And um, I don't for one second you know, condemn your decision to, to get out. Thank I you. think that, um, I think it's really easy to do that, quite frankly, is mm -hmm. to try to pile on to you. And uh, I'm not going to pretend that you know we weren't all whistling the brave Sir Robin you know refrain uh, you know <laughs> but but it's absolutely true because you know what you're the ones going home to your wife and your kids yeah. and at the end of the day I don't know what the situations of everybody else in that store was but I don't know what was necessarily stopping them from going out getting the training being a responsible armed American to protect themselves mm -hmm. so they had that choice and they could have fled too now obviously the woman that was targeted. Unfortunately, maybe she has got a relationship with that guy. Maybe she's a random stranger. Who really knows, right? Yeah. But mm -hmm. anyone else in that store could have also have gone through the same training and been in the same position. You're the one that took the steps to put yourself there to be able to make the choice to go home to your family. Mm. I'm not, I'm not <clears throat> throwing stones. Well, on yeah. top of that, what if the guy who was disgruntled at, you know, with the firearm... What if he was in cahoots with the other guy? Right. You draw mm. your weapon and now you're gone. And he was behind me too. So he was, mm. when I was looking for egress, he was back into my right. And yeah, it could have very easily turned to, if they were in cahoots, I'm, I'm blind to them now. We've got to mm -hmm. think of those things. Yeah, and for all the people who you know might be commenting, oh, I, I would have pulled out my gun and started shooting. You gotta save that person. You gotta do the right thing. It, it, it's very easy to say, but it, by saying that you probably haven't saw, thought through everything that's going to come in. Like, like Tom said, this will go on for years, okay. and your actions, whether you stop the bad guy or whether you accidentally shot the victim, um, that stays with you forever, and that's something that right. whatever you're going to do there, and if you chose not to do anything, great, you have saved yourself, and this is self-defense. This is not Absolutely. other people defense or stuff defense. This is self-defense. Yeah, and I think that's something that, you know, we've kind of glossed over so far in our discussions. But, you know, if you had shot the victim, if any of our of our people had shot the victim, 
I mean, talk about survival guilt. Talk about, I mean, mm -hmm. you want to talk about something that follows you for a lifetime? Yeah, I get it. You can argue that if you fail to act or if you act by, by retreating or strategically redeploying, maybe, um, as, <laughs> as what happened here, that, you know, well, you've got to live with the guilt of, of you know, letting her die. First off, I say no. All right, it's not that she chose to die, but everybody else, including her, presumably chose not to get trained, chose not to carry, chose not to become educated, and so forth. And I'm not saying that the properly trained, prepared person can resist evil when it rears its ugly head. I'm not saying that good wins the day every time, but it doesn't mean that just because you've done this that you have to take your life, your family, your best friends, your career, your everything, and jump into the shark tank every single time you see something that's out there. And additionally, right, you shoot the bad guy, you shoot the good guy too. Now you've got a lifetime of guilt that goes the other way. The only way that you walk out of that winning is if you do everything perfectly, under pressure, which as we've seen, you know, that obviously works out, right? Um, unless you get the Hollywood ending, um, and even then, now you're just stuck with the lawsuits, the criminal investigation, the arrests, <coughs> the newspaper stories, the who knows what, right? That, that's mm -hmm. our best case scenario outcome. So as somebody who professionally walks the path of seeing what the aftermath is um, on a daily basis with folks. Like I said, I'm, I, I can't criticize one bit what you did. Okay. Yeah. The best fight is the one you're not in. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And those so, words kind of ring true in my head. <laughs> you know, I hear Kevin say that a lot. So, I mean, it, it really is. There's a, working here at the USCCA, I do get a chance to hear those words a lot. And, you know, running or not, I mean, there's what I've been taught here, it, it rings true every time I step foot anywhere. One question for you is, yep. I guess, why not, and Kevin, Beth, if you guys want to weigh in too, so you raised your shirt as if to draw your firearm and then just like dropped it, turned around and booked it out basically. Guys, talk me through here. Why not at least draw your firearm? I mean, be mistaken as the bad guy? Is that a good thing, yeah, bad thing? It's, it's an opportunity to be mistaken for the bad guy. Um, mm. uh, you're, you're looking at this, and it's, it is a, a knife assault, and you pull your gun out, and someone else has called 911, and they just know that there's an attack, and you go running out of the store. And What if, by some strange coincidence, cop just happened to be going by, <laughs> and now you're running out with a gun <clears throat> in your hand? Um, at that point... His gun wasn't going to help him win that fight. He, was, he had already made the decision that I'm moving away from this. I'm getting out of here. He didn't need the gun. He didn't need the risk of a negligent discharge. He didn't need the, to think about trigger finger discipline. He needed to keep his gun safe and secure and get moving in the direction that he'd committed to that movement. It's a right call. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, no need to have the gun out. And the, the, all, you know, it's sort of like what they say in football. You know, too many things can go wrong when you throw a pass. Mm. It's, too many things can go wrong when you have your gun out and you're trying to move and communicate and figure out what the next step is. It's just one mm. more thing to think about. So if you're running a bad guy in the parking lot, that's obviously when right, then, fresh scenario, yep, yep. fresh chance to draw. Yep. But by and large, if you are egressing and you, there's no known danger in front of you, keep it don't holstered, don't, yeah. don't be a threat. Well, and there's one point, and I'm not really sure, um, but it almost sounded like our role player with the knife was saying, hey, where are you going? Where are you going? Come back here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If he had tried to pursue you, there's a totally different scenario yeah. as well. Or, or like you said, Tom, you run into somebody out in the parking lot. This guy's right. got an accomplice outside. Okay, pull out your gun and, and, and defend yourself there. Um, getting from point A to point B, uh, I would keep the gun put away. Yeah. So, so I got one last question for Jared here, okay. um, and this is actually from a, from a viewer. They wrote in. They said, "Jared, how would you have reacted differently if the guy with the knife had a gun?" I think it would have been a completely different situation. Um, obviously, at that point, if I still had a way of egress, I'm I'm gonna go. But if there's no way of egress, he's got a gun, and and I have to take a self defense action. It it. it it's going to happen. I'm not going to stop, and I'm not going to, I guess the difference between knife or gun, it really doesn't matter. Mm. If, there's a, if there's a way of egress, I'm going to get out. Mm -hmm. If it comes to a point where I have to take a self-defense action, it's going to happen. Okay. Cool. Good answer. Well, and if he's moving, he's now a moving target for the bad guy, and moving targets are very difficult to hit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, we even see from, like, Alice training, uh, you basically have a 90% chance of leaving with everything intact, alive and well, if you're running, if you're moving. So it was, it was a good choice, even if the guy had a firearm. Getting off the X. Great. Well, Jared, great job. Thank you again for Thank participating. You. Really appreciate, appreciate it. it.
So the next scenario that we're going to look at is really kind of, it's coming off some, of some special requ request training that's been coming in quite a bit, and they're from people that have a limited mobility. Uh, their concern is like, well, hey, what do I do if I'm in a wheelchair or if, or if I just have a limited mobility? So let's watch this next training video, and we're going to see exactly what happens. You and I worked on the Sheriff's Department for a short time together. Um, what do you still remember from the police academy? When are you going to use your gun? Uh, only when I am threatened or somebody else is threatened that I need to protect. Yeah, the, uh, it, it's a, uh, um, you know, we're using deadly force, so we're using deadly force to protect life against an imminent threat. Um, and uh, have you done any firearms training since you left the police service or anything like that? Uh, just at the range or... Okay. Just standard shooting and, and uh, um, do you practice at all, uh, dry practice drawing your gun from however you're going to carry it? Yep. Okay, so, um, but I still need to stress some things that we're going to be involved in here. Um, first of all, you know that the, the use of deadly force is a last resort. Yep. Um, if you can escape, we would prefer that you try to escape. We don't want you involved in a deadly shootout if you don't have to be. Yep. Um, but again, you're in a chair. That makes it a hell of a lot more difficult to get out of there. Mm -hmm. So um, you're going to be allowed to use your gun sooner. But you're still responsible for everything that goes on. When you pull that gun out, it's, it's your gun, it's your bullets, you own them. So anything that's going down range, we want to make sure that we're shooting accurately. Um, target isolation is of great importance. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're going to use your gun, I want you to use it effectively. So any questions that you got for us going into this? Uh, I mean, a lot of it was just uh, reinforcing uh, the decision to mm -hmm. take on that responsibility of pulling yeah. my weapon yeah. and just knowing uh, what can happen to mm -hmm. me legally or physically. Yeah, and, uh, and we want you to win both fights. We want you to win the initial, survive the initial encounter, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, you want to get out of there alive, but uh, you're, you're very right to be cognizant of what happens afterwards. You know, those are the questions people ask. When can I shoot somebody? What happens to me afterwards? Mm -hmm. um, first in this scenario, we want to get you through the scenario first, and we want to make sure that you get out of that scenario alive. So this is all, we're going back to the academy days again, deadly force decision making. Yep. At what point do you want to engage? And again, any action that has caused or imminently threatens to cause death or great bodily harm to you or another person or persons. So um, how and where you want to get into the fight is all completely up to you. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we're ready for the scenario. Are you ready? We'll see. Okay, we'll put you in it. Excuse me, do you have a frog rider or something? Yeah, yep, it's over there in that back corner on the right. What's yep. up, guys? It's just actually the same. How you doing? Hey. Um, I've got this book for my nephew, but it turns out he's already got it. Uh, hey, excuse uh, me. Uh, I got a birthday party for my nephew, and I don't. I haven't seen any of these games. A um, receipt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Any thoughts on this? No, nothing about that one. That one's a pretty good one, though. All right. Hey, appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, he, I don't know. I can't keep track of that stuff anymore. I mean, that's way beyond me. I'm too old for that. Um, you know what? I can't find the receipt, but I, I used my credit card yesterday when I was in here to purchase it. So, I mean, if you guys have any you know, kind of checking. Yeah, we can't. We have to have the receipt. It's just a store policy. I can't give you store credit for it, though. So store credit doesn't do me any good because, I mean, I, I don't shop here or nothing like that. It was a $50 book. You can't just. I mean, I get where you're coming from. Do you think maybe, like, it's at home? Like, did you bring it back with me? No, 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 no. no. No, no, I just, I just want the 50 bucks back, okay? Because, like, you know, like, like I said, I, I've got no use for it or anything like that. Yeah. It's not going to help me. I get, I get where you're coming from, but I really do need the receipt in okay. order to return it. You know, I don't know what kind of scam you're running here with this I'm store. I'm not running a scam, sir. If my manager but was here, which he'll be back this afternoon, you can come back like around two or three. I'm not going to wait. Here. I'm right here right now, and i got to go. So, I mean, if, if I have to, here, I'll tell you what. I'll take my phone. That's right. Hey, oh, hey, hey. Okay, we're back here. I'm sitting next to Don Albrecht. Don is the leader and manager of the USCCA online community. Now, for those of you who are like, wait a minute, what? Online community? I've never heard of that before. Well, it's relatively new. We started in 2019, 
And so Dawn, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So it's my understanding that the request for the uh, training scenario with the limited mobility came from the online community, is that correct? It's come from the online community and it also has come from a lot of our social platforms. I know we had it in mm -hmm. Facebook for a while. Okay. Yeah. So would you mind just kind of explaining to the viewers and to us a little bit about the, the, the online community and what, what, what the value is, what the benefit is? Definitely. The online community goes through all sorts of different questions that people pose. Um, it could be anything from should I get a SIG 365 to, uh, or a Glock 43X, what type of ammo should I use, the lovely questions about killer ammo, is it any worse, <laughs> legal questions which maybe we can rope Tom into coming on at some point. And Correct okay. answer is Glock by the way. Just uh, so. It's SIG <laughs> but we're not going to go there. Um, Kevin, Tim and Beth have actually all been in the community to make some comments and give some feedback. But it's really a great place to go and have conversations about anything self-defense related. And when we start looking at what people are bringing through the community, that, that really helps us guide what we want to talk about um, from Concealed Carry Magazine to what we're doing in the videos and, and, and things like that. We're really trying to be responsive. And what, a couple hundred now, different threads on this online community? A couple hundred or, different threads. Yeah, in um, fact, um, sorry, we good. did put in um, the question from today's. Are you going to shoot? Are you going to run? Are you going to hide? And surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, 87% said they'd, they'd engage. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, the other 13% was split between the other two groups. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people clarified, I'd engage after I watched or got into a better position to engage. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and that, you know, it comes back to something I said all the time. Everybody thinks they're going to win the fight. Yep. They might not. <coughs> yeah. You know, it's, right. uh, so that, that's one of the things that I warn people all the time is, you know, don't be overconfident about this. This is something that you've mm -hmm. never done before. And if you consider the fact that bad guys have probably been involved in a shooting somewhere along the line, they might have more experience in this than we do. So, so don't have a question for you. So I, I know from experience when I was kind of going through my own self-defense awakening, i.e. I was learning everything I could mm -hmm. about what it would take to be a you know, responsibly armed American you know, and be my family's defender, um, there were all sorts of questions that I had that I was kind of embarrassed about asking because I thought, oh, this is such a newbie question. The last thing I want to do is go down to the gun range or the gun store and ask, ask a question and get laughed at. So is the community a good place for questions like that? How, how does that work? It is the best place for questions like that. Um, we don't expect everyone to know everything. I started out going to a Citizens Academy in my local city and had a great time, and that's what really prompted me on my self-defense journey. And those officers I worked with were great, but I also went, huh, you know, I don't know much about guns, I don't know much about this, I don't know much about that. And I didn't have a lot of people to talk to. Come into the community, ask a question. We even have a couple threads on there for newbies specifically, okay. and what our newbie errors were, because we all had them. Excellent. I know we talked about it today, what's the rule? There's you one rule. have to be respectful. Yeah, be nice. So, so that's yeah. another great point because I'm sure that you know back in maybe what 10, 15 years ago, internet forums were all the rage, mm -hmm. and um, gosh, you know, you'd go on a forum and you'd ask a question and you'd just get lambasted for like, oh, you yeah. dummy, how can you not know that? You, mm -hmm. you know, blah blah blah. And so, the you know, from my experience, the best community online communities are the ones that are moderated and they have mm -hmm. professionals who are making sure that that the the, the, the participants are are as you said being nice, and, right. and we have that as well, right? Oh, yep, I'm on there seven days a week. That's actually, you're, like, That's you're like the tip of the spear, right? <laughs> that I mean, is, okay. yes. So <laughs> but also the community is very good at self-moderating too. They're very supportive. If I'm out doing, am I in the range for an hour, I'm not online, someone has a question, someone else is gonna jump in and answer. Nice, excellent. Well, I have to admit, I'm, I'm really excited about the USCCA online community. I, I can't believe how fast it's grown, mm -hmm. and uh, it's exciting that that there's so many people getting so much value out of it. And, and really what's happening is that, is that these people are, are, are making good progress on their own yes. personal self-defense journey, um, which is really what we're all about. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, the mission of the USCCA is to, is, to, is to make everyone who has that inner understanding and belief that it's their responsibility to be their family's first line of defense, it's, it's to, to make it happen for them and, uh, and make it happen in an easy, uh, simple way. Mm -hmm. Which, which makes me happy, so good, so good job done. Um, a few more questions are coming in. I mean, I know there's, there's thousands of people watching this right now and it's impossible to answer all the questions, but, uh, but before we go, and I know that 
Max is somewhere in there. He's, you know, we are going to give the three Glocks away soon, so hang in there. Um, but one of the questions that just came in here is, uh, does the USCCA have a list of attorneys that I can look through and or, and, and or can I use my own attorney? And who wants to handle this question? There is a list, but you can absolutely use your own attorney. It's one of, one of the fantastic things about being a USCCA member is that you're not locked into something, all right? Because that's, frankly, what some of the other options are that's out there. Um, you get the training, you get the legal protection, but it's a backer. Somebody is walking with you on the journey. If you want to go a different direction, if you want to have a different attorney, God bless. But no one's locking in or telling you that you have to do it this way, and hopefully their choice is as good as, as your choice, because it may not be. Yeah, that's a great answer, Tom. And, and, um, and just to put a point on that, in terms of the actual attorney resources that we have, we have over 1,000 lawyers. Now, these are pre-screened, pre-approved, uh, pro-Second Amendment lawyers who, who are experts in self-defense, and they're all over the country. Every single state is covered, and they're literally waiting for the calls from our critical response team and our members who need help. And of those over 1,000, I believe we're close to 900 now are on call 24 hours, um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which, which is awesome. And um, certainly I'll admit I'm proud of that because it's a great members, member resource, um, but, but that's exactly how it works. So excellent question. Thank you for that one. And I don't know any other organization that has close to 1,000 attorneys on call 24-7. I mean, uh, there I, I'm, I'm unaware of anyone else <laughs> yeah. close to that. Yeah. Um, one more question that just popped up. This is a really good one. It says, um, uh, if I have a question, who can I talk to? Can I call you 24-7? Um, I, I want to answer this one because I'm, I'm so uh, excited about this, uh, about the way things are, are right now. Probably about a year and a half ago, um, the gentleman that runs our entire member service department uh, made the pitch to me. He said, Tim, this is crazy. We, we, can't close our, we can't close our phones, turn our phones off at 10 p.m. Because guess what? There's people that work second shift. There's people that work third shift. And they need to talk to us. And we need to be there whenever our customers, whenever our members um, want to talk to us. So he did a pilot. He did like a 60-day pilot um, where essentially we, he, we, we mimicked a 24-7, 365-day member services team um, just to see just how much it would cost and, and if we could afford it. And the good news is that it was a, a roaring success. And so for well over a year now, member service agents at USCCA have been available 24-7 every single day of the year. And that's on phones, email, social, and computer chat. So any time of the day, if you have any question about anything, whether it's your membership, whether you're just thinking about becoming a member, you can contact us, and you're going to be talking to someone that's in this building in West Bend, Wisconsin, and they will be able to help you out. So, uh, again, something you can tell I'm proud about, but it's just another one of the great membership benefits of, of being a USCCA member. I think it's really important to mention how well-trained all of our member service oh. people are and, and our social care people and stuff like that. Um, it, we go out of our way to make sure that they get the best possible information and that they're sharing everything that, that we have um, from the magazine side, from the content creation side, from the training side. Um, they're working with all of the other departments around this company to understand that, that we're giving out that information. Somebody calls and, and we're going to help them. Yeah. One of my favorite things to do is, so as you can imagine, all sorts of members who are traveling around the country, they stop here in West Bend. Um, you know, and they say, hey, I want a tour of your facility because it's a beautiful place. Um, not to mention other business leaders in town want a tour of the place. So I love giving tours of the USCCA headquarters. And one of the things I like the most is I, is I show them our, our internal training rooms. Mm -hmm. And I say, just so you know, every couple of months we have a brand new class of member service agents. Uh, and you know, we, we put them through the training, a class at a time between 10 and 15 people. And they go through training for eight weeks. Mm -hmm. That's two full months before they even talk to a customer. And the reason we do that is because it's super important, very critical for us, that when our members call, when our prospects call in, they talk to someone that knows what they're talking about. And every time I, I give that stat that it's literally eight weeks of training, no one can believe me. So mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, again, it's very exciting to, to know that, that when the USCCA members call in, they're talking to people that not only believe in the same, same things that, that they believe in, but know what they're talking about. Right. Good no one, stuff. No one's learning on the job. No one is <laughs> no We're one's not learning just on guessing. the job. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> nope. So I know we got to get, uh, get moving along here, but there was one more question, or, or two questions that are related that I want to talk about. And the first one is, um, so this scenario that we, that we um, 
kind of the, or that you modeled here was based mm -hmm. on a, a, a Excuse me, a real attack that happened in a target. Yeah, and uh, and, and, and so the, the question here is that, hey, tar targets are gun-free zones. Mm -hmm. So what do you do if you're in a gun-free zone and something like this happens? Well, you can see exactly what the people in this store did, which was panic and, and um, you know, there was a guy who tried to jump on this, this attacker's back and he missed and um, it just became pandemonium. Um, in, in that situation, you know, depending on where you are and, and what's going to happen, and I'll let Tom talk about that more, but if you're carrying in a gun-free zone, some states, well, you're just, you know, you might get a trespass violation or be asked to leave or something like that. Other states, you might be committing a felony when you do that. You need to know your local laws. But in, in a situation like that, if, if you're in a gun-free zone, and, and, you know, the, the question is, how much training do you have to try to take away a knife from a violent attacker? And uh, the answer for most of us is not enough. So um, weapons of opportunity, you know, you might need to, um, you know, pick up uh, something heavy and see if you can get around behind them while someone else has got them, you know, distracted. So yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. what, <clears throat> exactly what Kevin said. You know, what we're talking about here is the laws can vary so much. You might be looking at a ticket. You might be looking at nothing. You might be looking at felonies. You just don't know because not only do you have what the laws say, but then you've got a whole extra variable, which is how are the laws going to be enforced? So maybe you're in an area where, look, here's what it says on the books, but it might be enforced in a much more lenient way. Or you might be in an area where, here's what it says on the books, but it might be enforced in a much more strict way, which is to say, maybe they can't nail you for this, but they're gonna make your life hell in all these other areas. And bringing it back to, to Casey in the last scenario here, keep in mind that if you do have mobility issues, obviously, yes, that's going to be affecting your ability to retreat but it may not necessarily change the fact, and it will never change the fact, that the laws don't, don't change when they apply to you. Let me rephrase that so it's a little bit cleaner. The laws in self-defense do not necessarily change because you may have mobility restrictions. However, when you are in an actual deadly force or deadly threat environment or circumstance might change because you are in a mobility restricted situation. Mm -hmm. So remember, the laws don't change, but the facts do. And that may change when certain laws come into play. But here, if you're in a situation where you're in a wheelchair and you're in a defensive other person situation, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that's necessarily going to change of, look, we've crossed a bright line, this woman's in a deadly force environment. I think you might try to argue as well that, well, first off, in this case, she obviously was, but uh, otherwise, you know, well, if he can't retreat, the guys, I think Casey in our scenario was about, I don't know, 10 feet or something mm -hmm. like that from the bad guy, so he's about a second away from being the next knife victim, which mm -hmm. we saw play out in scenario number three with Jared, where he mm -hmm. started with the woman, then he went to phone guy, yeah. for lack of a way yeah. of putting it. Yeah. Um, he, went to, he went to cell phone guy. <laughs> Um, so you never know, and I think that that scenario three point is worth remembering, that just because the guy started with the first victim doesn't mean he's going to stop with the first victim. First victim could be first victim. In other words, second, third, fourth, you don't know. And I think that that, bringing it back to Casey in the wheelchair, you don't know when other pe people defense could turn into self-defense. And if you've got two feet that work, okay. If you're not so fast, I don't care if you've got two feet, two feet in a cane, I don't, it doesn't matter. That changes the math for you, and you got to take that into consideration. Yeah, and, and like you said, Tom, you're, you're always going to, um, you know, have to be faced with an imminent deadly threat, an imminent right. threat of death or great bodily harm. And in the case with Casey here in, in the store, he's not really going to be able to get out of there um, the way Jared was able right. to get out of there. And we're talking, you know, 10 feet distance, and he decided one he wanted to help but two you're right you see the next guy in the line you know and and the threat is still imminent the weapon is still there the intent is still there he felt like he had to do something and and he started shooting and casey was really fast to draw and something i really liked what casey did is he yelled drop the knife yes. three times mm -hmm. i think before he start he fired his first shot yeah. wow. which which mm -hmm. could be could be great from a lawsuit perspective of mm -hmm. It's not like, well, there was some sort of miscommunication or this was some sort of viral prank video. I mean, yeah. they had their chance. Yeah. Wow. Well, and that comes with a lot of training as well. When we were talking about, you know, what to say to a potential person who's in your bubble, all those things come with training. If you haven't practiced even saying something like back off or drop the knife, 
how are you going to do it yeah, when you your life is you right mm -hmm. in front of you? Yeah, yeah, you have to practice and train even right. those verbal commands now. Yeah. And, and just to put a point on this, because I know a lot of people are watching this that are thinking, well, geez, how am I going to find a place to do this amazing scenario? Well, you don't have to. Even just rehearsing it in your mind exactly. and thinking mm -hmm. about what, what I would say, I mean, that's, that's obviously not the best, but it's, it's good enough. Mm -hmm. It's good enough, so don't forget that. Um, guys, all great points. Um, Tom, I just wanted to make a point on the last batch of, of things that you said. Uh, so it reminded me that a lot, of, a lot of the times we get feedback from the viewers saying, holy cow, that Tom Grieve guy, he really seems smart. How, how can I connect with him or, or get more information? So would you mind just kind of sharing your website and, sure. and how people can learn more about you? Well, fantastic way, you know, that really supports me being able to, to be here and help out, not only in this, but also if you're a member as well, you get access to all sorts of other content that not only that, that I participate in, but that other people up here, Beth, Kevin, and so forth, also participate in and make. A lot of fantastic comments, a lot of fantastic content and reviews. Um, but something that really helps me in particular make this is folks, if you could just take a couple minutes, Google Grieve Law, G-R-I-E-V-E, -E, Grieve Law, in the upper right hand corner, you see a Google review box. Just hit that review button and just drop us, if you don't mind, a five star grade. Keep in mind it's the internet. They ask you to grade us on a one to five star scale. Four is failing, all right? <laughs> Welcome to the internet, all right? So folks, I, something that not only from myself, but also from my entire team back at the office, we're the largest criminal defense and law firm in the entire state of Wisconsin. I know everybody at the office would tremendously appreciate it, not just myself, but if you could just take the 15 seconds, it's totally free, just Google again, Grieve Law, find any of our locations, more the merry, I'll add, but any of our locations, and just drop that five-star review. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome, and please do that. Tom's a, a really great friend of the USCCA, and he's a good friend of mine, too. Um, all right, so as you can tell, if you've watched these before, the, we've kind of mixed the format up a little bit, and so now we're actually going to give away all three guns. So Max, I believe, will be entering the stage soon. But before I do that, I just want to say, Dawn, thank you so much for, for being on the show tonight. Thanks for having me. Um, but really, thank you from the bottom of my heart for being such a great leader of the community program. Thank you. And a lot of the conversations that you guys just heard, they're actually going on in the, in the community right now. Mm. How to say something, what words to use, we're talking about that now. Okay, so just real quick then, if, if a person wanted to access the community, how do you do it? USCCA.com slash community. Huh. All right, that's easy. And I plan on checking that out, folks. So it's oh, another good. great way to reach me. Oh, excellent. All right, Max, make it happen. Thank you, sir. All right, so is this the first one or all three? First one. All right, so this is, we're going to do all three right now. The first winner of a Glock 19, right? Or is it a 17? 19. Glock 19. The first name is John. And... The first four characters, I'm sorry, first five characters of the email are jd.be. So John, if, you're, so if your name is John and you have an email address that starts with jd.be, um, you just won a gun, man. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. So good job. All right, Max, number two. <laughs> this is my favorite part of the whole event. <laughs> okay. So the next winner, hopefully you're watching right now. Um, the, the winner of the next Glock 19 is, uh, his first name is David. So if your name is David, um, you'll be especially happy when I read the first four letters of your email, which is C-R-E-W, crew. So David with an email that starts with C-R-E-W. Now for the first two winners, um, you will be contacted by Max or one of his associates um, via your full email address, and uh, we'll tell you what to do to to claim the gun. Um, I believe we have one more left, so let's do it. It's like Vanna White. This is fun, no, I, could, I could do this all night. <laughs> Mostly because I know that right now, everyone watching this video is excited. <laughs> Waiting. <laughs> Waiting. Waiting. Um, okay, the final winner of tonight is first name Tom, T-O-M, and the email starts with E-S-I-T. E-S-I-T. So Tom, congratulations. Um, congratulations to all our winners, um, and really, honestly, this may sound a little cheesy, but everyone is a winner who's actually watching this tonight, <laughs> because you're learning. You're learning a lot of great information, um, and that's really important. So, I guess, at this point, um, I, I just got a few housekeeping things to take care of. 
Uh, I believe that the replay of this entire video will be sent out to you um, if you signed up for this, so that'll be great. You'll be able to, to review all of the great commentary. Hopefully you heard some great commentary tonight, um, as well as watching all the videos again, which as we know, um, even just sitting there watching them and visualizing yourself in those situations is very, very powerful and valuable. Um, I gotta tell you guys, it is, it is an honor, it is a dream come true to sit here on this set with such amazing guests and, and amazing people that are making all this happen. All of the 100 plus USCC employees that are working right now, whether in their call center or on the chat uh, systems to, to answer um, all of the questions. It, it's amazing to, to sit here and, and be a part of this because ultimately, as I was saying, I was explaining to the guests here before we started, I said, guys, hey, what we're about to do tonight, I mean, yes, we're gonna have fun. We're gonna share some great information, but don't underestimate the fact that something that one of us says tonight will probably change someone's life. Um, whether they're, it'll help them to avoid a defensive situation or whether it'll allow them to prevail in a, in a situation. Um, and we don't take that lightly. So um, I just wanna share that with you. Um, I guess lastly, I will just say thank you to, to the guests. Um, Kevin, it's always a pleasure to be here with thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I remember when you and I started working together a long time ago, I, I couldn't believe you actually were willing to come to work for me. Oh, I'm so. having the time of my life. <laughs> you, you're going to drag me out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy. Uh, Dawn, thanks again for being here. Thanks, Tim. Um, you do a great job with the community, and, and um, I'm glad, glad you're on the show tonight. Thank you. Tom, as usual. You, uh, you add a tremendous amount of, of value and insight to, to, to this, this program, and um, I know that our, our members and customers and prospects are always happy to have you here because you answer all their questions so well. So thank you. And last but not least, Beth, thanks for being such an important part of the, of the USCCA team. I know that, that all sorts of uh, people, especially the women in our community, really look up to you as, as the defender that they would really like to be. That's awesome. Um, so I think we're getting close to being done. Um, we pretty much wrapped up all the questions. And so again, thanks for being here. Um, if for some reason uh, you, you stumbled upon this, this, this broadcast and, for, and you're not a USCCA member, um, this is a short message from my heart. I hope that you would consider joining the family. This is a group of people who, who um, it's really a group of people all across the country, over 300,000 Americans who have made the commitment that they're going to be their family's first line of defense. And we understand that that's all about education, training, and legal protection. And that's why we do these. Um, and so I would really encourage you to, to join, our, join our family, become a USCCA member, and, and take your own journey. Take the first step of your own journey to be your family's first line of defense. So with that, I will say thank you very much. Take care and stay safe.